territory and your primary runs dry, what do you do? You transition to your sidearm and you better hope you're packing this. It's the most admired and influential pistol of the 20th century. So powerful. It's been carried by armed forces for the last century. Yet even a gun as revolutionary as Colt's M1911 was triggered by centuries of innovations. I'm putting this legendary weapon and its groundbreaking predecessors to the test to see how it gained its worldwide reputation as the ultimate man stopper. This is the Colt 45! Firepower. Nothing shaped military capability more. I'm Will Willis, former Army Ranger and Air Force Pararescueman. I've trained with modern weapons until firing them is second nature. Now I'm teaming up with leading experts to examine the greatest military firearms of all time and discover how these weapons change the world. It's one of the most storied names in firearms, a gun admired by servicemen and collectors alike, the Colt 45. This weapon demands respect. It's rugged, reliable, and very powerful, and it helped make history. Near the end of World War I, U.S. Army Corporal Alvin York and his fellow soldiers are pinned down from heavy German fire. Their only hope is to outflank the enemy and take them out. It's a certain suicide mission. They crawl their way through the barbed wire, bullets, and heavy brush, surprising the Germans in an enemy trench. And up! And up! And up! Right. As they take the German soldiers prisoner, Sergeant York and his men come under fire from another German trench. York takes careful aim at the gunners. But when his rifle runs out of rounds, Germans armed with bayonets attack. York grabs his army-issued sidearm, the M1911, a Colt 45 semi-automatic pistol, and kills six charging enemy soldiers. That morning, Alvin York single-handedly saves his unit from destruction and takes 132 prisoners, earning him the rank of sergeant, the Medal of Honor, and legendary status. Now, Sergeant York must have been an awesome shot and incredibly brave to have done that with a Colt 45. I've been trained on a lot of modern weapons, but never the Colt M1911. But now's my chance. Often called the Colt 45 automatic, the M1911's reputation is legendary. I'll be putting that reputation to the test with help from weapons historians and veteran marksmen. Now. This is Grant Reynolds, former Marine sniper, firearms instructor, and expert with the M1911. The M1911 was invented in the time when we were still riding horseback into battle. The stopping power was there, the simple design, easy to clean, magazine changes. It changed the name of the game. It revolutionized a sidearm. This was designed by John Browning in the early part of the 1900s. This was America's sidearm for all of the armed forces from 1911 all the way to 1985. It has a magazine which we put seven rounds of 45 ACP in and you insert it into the pistol grip just like that. This magazine only has seven rounds compared to a lot of modern weapons like the Beretta, which I'm used to, it has 15 rounds. Seems like advantage Beretta. What makes you love this pistol so much? One thing, very simply stopping power. I know that when I pull this trigger, no matter where I'm pointing at, it's gonna go down, it's gonna stop. I just can't think of a weapon that was introduced in 1911 that's still being produced today, virtually unchanged. So at the turn of the 20th century, this was a great advance in pistol technology over the revolver, is that correct? Oh, no doubt about it. The basic principle of the M1911 is recoil operation. It uses the bullet's energy when fired to reload itself. Combustion gases from the speeding bullet force the slide backward. 
A claw extractor then pulls the spent casing from the firing chamber, and a spring propels the slide forward, stacking a fresh round into position. The slide finally locks into the barrel, and the gun's ready to fire again. I know how I like to shoot a pistol and my setup and stance, but uh, do you have any pointers for this particular weapon system? Let me show you. All right. Very simple. I just like to drop my leg back a little bit. OK. It's going to give me a little bit of natural body alignment, and it's also going to reduce my silhouette a little bit as I'm just kind of looking down range. I'm going to take my right hand, and I'm just going to drive it right into my left hand. I'm going to do a little push-pull right there. Now I'm concentrating on that front sight, and I'm squeezing that trigger right down through the center line of this pistol right here all day long. What I want to know is, does the M1911 really live up to its reputation? So I've devised a Sergeant York challenge. So what we've got are these recreated World War I trenches. But you won't be firing against wine bottles. You're going to be up against these guys. Six members of the Great War Historical Society will be Grant's German opponents. From his trench, Grant will have to take them down with his Colt M1911 before they overrun his position. In order to do this safely, we're going to use simunition. The cool thing about this is that it's a non-lethal round that leaves a visible mark on impact. And it can be fired through a real gun at about the same accuracy and rate of fire as a real bullet. These special rounds are only available to military and law enforcement. In normal training exercises, total head protection is required. Grant, are you ready to go? Going hot. All right, let's see it. I'll provide Grant a little spotting support with a trench periscope. Here they come. In the World War I battle, the Germans charged Sergeant York when they heard his rifle mag empty. The only thing that could stop them was his Colt 45. Oh, yeah. Here's another. The M1911 fires at a muzzle velocity of 835 feet per second with an effective range of 75 yards. Change mags, change mags. They're going to be off to your left, left, left. And I'm out of ammo. Sweet. What if I went that way for Sergeant York, you know? I can't even imagine how heavy he was breathing and what the blood must have been doing inside of his body. Yeah, but anytime you get the, the troops kind of channelized towards you, that works to your advantage. Definitely. All right, let's go talk to him. Nice stuff. My blood was pumping when you guys were coming at me. I mean, I was sitting there just trying to figure out who to engage first. And I mean, then just you... imagine if there was a couple hundred more oh, guys coming yeah, at you. Definitely. So what did you think about the uh, performance of the M1911? Honestly, you know, if we'd been coming up at you with Lugers, there's no way you wouldn't be able to hold that trench. So hold on, you're saying the Luger is a better pistol than the M1911? Most definitely. Are, are you willing to uh, put your money where your trigger finger is? Bring it on. The Pistola Parabellum 08, commonly known as the Luger, after its designer, Georg Luger, is the forerunner of today's 9mm pistols, like those made by Beretta and Glock. It was issued to German soldiers and officers through both world wars. If you think of one weapon that would symbolize the Imperial German military, this is it. It's a very finely designed firearm. It's exquisitely made. I mean, you hold it and it just sort of just molds itself to your hand. So how do these pistols that faced each other in combat stack up? For this test, we're going to see which World War I pistol, the M1911 or the Luger 08, has the faster rate of fire and the most power. And it's my first chance to get behind the Colt. I'm going to run into this trench and take out all the targets as quickly as I can, this time with live rounds. But first, German weapons expert Dan Sutton and his Luger will run the course. Go! Clearing a trench out with a Luger actually would have been much easier than this competition. In a real world situation, your target's never that small. M1911 
50. 16 rounds, you hit five targets. 40 seconds, not bad, Dan. Let's see what Will can do. At 0.45 inches in diameter, a 45 caliber round is equal to 11 millimeters, almost 25% larger than the Luger's nine millimeter. Will, you ready? Going hot, go! Trench warfare is always challenging. Anything can be coming around those corners. It's amazing to look back and see what those guys kind of went through. I do have a newfound respect for the 1911. The action feels great. It feels good in your hand, and that's one of the key things when you're firing a pistol. How does it feel in your hand? How does it incorporate to your body when you're engaging with that thing? 14 rounds, eight hits. Including the rat. 38 seconds. It's not bad, and you had 40. Okay, and five hits? Five hits All with right. 16 rounds. Right, so what we've got is a pretty evenly matched weapons. I mean, you got nine mil versus 45. Your weapon holds eight rounds in the magazine, mine seven. But uh, I think the big differences here are the caliber of the weapon. You got a nine millimeter versus a 45. So um, thanks a lot, man. It was okay. awesome. Good job. Thank I you. appreciate it. Good shooting. The rivalry between Colt's M1911 and its 9mm competitors continues to this day, and we'll soon test how it stacks up to its newest rifle. But first, I want to see what made the 1911 so revolutionary. It was the U.S. Army standard issue sidearm for 75 years, and it still sees action today. To see exactly what the Colt 45 cartridge can do, we've brought in a ballistics gel torso complete with organs and blood. The torso accurately reveals the damage caused by a round. Discover the past with exclusive military history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all on History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to watch everything, from the gripping story of the Band of Brothers to Operation Barbarossa and D-Day. Immerse yourself in the dramatic stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. I'm a trained combat medic specializing in wound trauma, and I want to show you the serious damage caused by this 45 ACP round and introduce you to the concept of stopping power. came in here. Look at that relatively small entrance wound. Well, the great thing about skin is that it's got so much elasticity to it. It can really take some damage, okay? And this stuff is made to flex and move around the body. And this round enters here. I can't even get my finger inside of that thing, but the cavitation wave, as this thing transfers its kinetic energy into these tissues, is really what's the most devastating thing. And the body reacts to that by just pulling away from that trauma. So this round, it comes through here, and it exits right here. Again, a relatively small exit wound, but what you have is this large cavitation on the inside. You've got the spleen back here. You've got the kidneys back here. Those things don't handle trauma well at all. They're solid organs. They rip and they tear, and a lot of blood gets filtered through those things. So when you hit the oil filters for the body, it's just like your car. They leak and leak and leak until it runs out of oil. And then just like in a car, your engine seizes up. The heart's gonna seize up. The only thing that's gonna save him is a hospital. To truly appreciate how the Colt M1911 revolutionized firearms, you have to see where it came from. The story of the pistol goes back over 500 years. Then, just as now, a man wanted a weapon that he could easily conceal, manipulate and fire with one hand, and reach out and kill from beyond arm's reach. 400 years before the M1911, the first handguns appeared in Europe, a development triggered by the invention of an ignition system called the wheel lock. Here to teach me how to fire one is early firearms authority, Paul Masterson. A lot of people don't really know a whole lot about ancient firearms. There's a lot of processes that can go wrong in it. With the invention of the wheel lock, you finally had a weapon that you could preload and was available to present fire and engage an enemy at a moment's notice. This was a huge evolution in the firearm. 
So that's a black powder pistol. This is a black powder wheel lock pistol. It's a reproduction made by master craftsman Dale Shin. So this looks more like a piece of art than a deadly killing weapon. Well, this was a state-of-the-art piece for its time. It functions a lot like our modern lighters. We've got a hardened steel wheel in the center that would create a shower of sparks against this piece of iron pyrite here. So this was a huge advantage to the guys who carried it because it, it presented fire more quickly since you had the ignition system basically right next to the rest of the charge. And depending on what sort of unit you were, whether you're artillery, cavalry, et cetera, you might carry different lengths. Like here we've got some cavalry pistols. These are more accurate as they have a longer barrel, and you would usually carry them in a match pair. This fired a spherical lead round, is that correct? Absolutely. They were handmade, okay. not exactly precision milled. <laughs> yeah. So you'd have to snip this, uh, this little piece off, and uh, depending on how accurate you wanted to be, maybe spend a little time, give it a little love, polish yeah. it off. You'd pack it in as tight as you could, but there's still going to be a bit of play because it's a smooth bore. Right. It's sort of like a, a marble down a steel tube. What do you say that we go and shoot this thing and find out exactly how accurate it is? Sounds great. I've got a target set up right over here. All right, let's make it happen, Let's Cap. do it. Pull the trigger, and it'll spark up. All right, here we go. Yeah, that's disappointing. <laughs> what was that all about? Anticlimactic there, yeah. 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 The primary ignition lit, but the secondary ignition did not. OK, so it's got a dual ignition system. Correct. In this misfire, the spark lit the first charge, but the black powder that propels the ball failed to ignite, a failure that in battle could cost you your life. So we just fill this up with powder again and give it another shot? Absolutely. Ready to fire. All right. So right here, I mean, I'm aiming center mass here. The round goes through here, and what I'm sitting about 10 meters away, so I'm only about 30 feet. Not the most accurate weapon. Especially not compared to a, a modern pistol. Could have had a lot of play in the barrel. Send it off. Including idiosyncrasies in the round itself, which was hand -cast. Correct. Okay. Correct. Let's try it again, see if we can hit this thing. All right. This time, I'm just 15 feet away. Now that is a hand cannon. Not bad. Not bad, yeah. I went right where I wanted it to, and there was that little bit of a delay. But uh, it's pretty intimidating stuff. Certainly not something you want to be on the receiving end of. Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> After the wheel lock, the next evolution in the firearm was the snap hands. The big difference, we're moving from iron pyrite into flint. This is sort of the first of the flint locks. But after this, the next evolution went to what we know as the flint lock. The flint lock became the mainstay of firearms for quite some time until we start getting into the cartridges. So this was like a no-nonsense, not very complicated weapon. Yeah, what became so popular about this was it was a lot simpler than the snap hands or the wheel lock. It was sort of the AK-47 of its day, really robust, really simple. Instead of having a moving pan cover like we had with the wheel lock, you now have the introduction of the frizzen, which is both the striking surface and covers the pan. Less moving parts, less things to worry about, just really robust. You just don't have as much to deal with. And it was a lot less costly to make. They say in the day you could get about three of these for each wheel lock, so a lot of people tended to want that. So taking all this into consideration, which one of these two weapons would I want in a duel? Well, it's tough to say. I mean, some people say that the wheel lock ignites faster. Some people say that the flint lock ignites faster. So okay. why don't we try it out? For an accurate comparison, I'll fire both the wheel lock and the flint lock at exactly the same time. Two, three. You'll see that the wheel lock is the first to fire its ball. It's close, but when aiming at a moving target, it makes a big difference. Most early handheld firearms were only single-shot weapons. While you were reloading, you were very vulnerable to an adversary. To solve this problem, firearms designers started experimenting with guns with multiple barrels that were all loaded and ready to fire. I'm going to test how well this idea worked. This is the pepper box pistol. It has multiple barrels, only fires one shot at a time. You can see the barrels right here. Trigger, hammer, it's a pretty simple thing. 
Now, I'm told that it's not very accurate or reliable. Let's see what happens. <laughs> they might be right. Now that's more like it. Okay, what I've got here is a cap and ball duck foot pistol. Each one of these barrels is loaded with a ball with powder behind it. And when you pull this trigger, all three rounds are firing at the same time. Particularly useful if you are a bad shot or if you're trying to hit multiple targets with one shot. All right. So I took out two of my three targets, but I'd rather have a weapon that I can engage decisively multiple times, you know, boom, 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 and know that I'm gonna hit those targets. By the 1830s, the quest for rapid fire triggers a revolutionary new gun, the revolver. A driving force behind its development was American inventor and industrialist Samuel Colt. According to popular legend, he gets the inspiration for the revolver by observing the turning spokes on a ship's wheel. Colt carves his idea out of wood, a revolving cylinder with multiple chambers aligned with a single barrel. He patents his idea when he is just 18. Colt ultimately manufactured his first revolver in Patterson, New Jersey in 1836. And this is it, the first Colt revolver, the Colt Patterson. Weapons specialist Mike Tristano explains its impact. Colt Patterson represents a revolutionary step in firearms development. It took advantage of a new ignition system called the percussion cap, which fired much more reliably than the footlock did in bad weather. This is a cap and ball or uh, you know, percussion system weapon. Okay. It's got five chambers, so you're gonna put your powder in each chamber first, then you put your 36 caliber ball with a patch, which is gonna help with the accuracy. Then you put some grease over the chambers, which can avoid something called a chain fire, which can happen if there's powder outside of the, oh, okay. the chambers. Right, you right, don't right. want everything going off at once on you. Exactly. Gotta blow you and the gun up. And then once you get that, then you put your percussion caps onto these nipples that are on the ends here then you're ready to go. It actually feels a lot better in the hand, a lot more contemporary than these other things did. Some of these were really clunky. Yeah, I mean, this is a huge jump ahead okay. in firearms technology, and it was the start of the whole cult dynasty of firearms. Well, I can't wait to shoot it. Are you ready? Let's give it a try. The trigger squeeze on the Patterson is a little extreme, but it's worth the effort. shooting. I was actually really surprised. It was a lot more accurate than I thought it was going to be, and I was also firing in a more traditional way. I mean, usually with a weapon this big, I would use both hands and be in a but stable tactic. But you a more traditional gunfighter yeah. or real Western style of one-handed shooting. Yeah, trying to be a, a gunslinger, so to speak. Seems it worked pretty well for you. <laughs> it was OK. I, it worked pretty good. How was the recoil with that compared to the wheel lock or the flint lock? It wasn't that bad, to tell you the truth. I didn't feel a lot of muzzle flip or anything like that. Maybe it just felt like it was more a part of my arm and I was able to absorb the recoil better. you were shooting a more modern firearm, which, yes. which you know, compared to the others, it was. So. Yeah, it felt great, yeah. man. I, I really liked it a lot. Colts Patterson changes the way battles are fought after the legendary Texas Rangers use it in the Mexican-American War. Rivals are stunned by a gun that immediately refires. And in the Civil War, cavalry officers find that horses and revolvers are a natural fit. But the Patterson has to be dismantled, loaded, and rebuilt to fire again. The Army wants a more reliable sidearm. 
The American Civil War spurs firearms manufacturers to design ever more effective weapons, utilizing the latest technological innovations from Europe. Perhaps the biggest, the metal cartridge. Also called a round, it packages the bullet, gunpowder, and primer into a single metallic case, precisely made to fit a firing chamber. These developments lead to the first of Samuel Colt's legendary 45 caliber pistols. It's the Colt Single Action Army Revolver, known as the Peacemaker, because if you had one of these, or better yet, two of these, and people knew about it, they didn't want to be on the business end of it. Now, I'm more at home firing a semi-automatic pistol like the 9mm Beretta. To fully master a legacy weapon like this requires a little bit different touch. To appreciate the qualities and the power of the Colt 45, I've brought in world champion gunslinger and Hollywood gun coach, Joey Dillon. In my opinion, the Colt Peacemaker is the ultimate gun. It's got one foot in the past, but it's still modern enough to use it if you want home defense or target practice. Nobody else has the old West except this country, and this gun helped tame that West. It's just the perfect gun. That's what I think. It's not just all dog and pony show. You've hey. actually got skills. I hit what I aim at. It's a good thing, yes. because I could use some coaching tips on handling this weapon. All right. Now, this was known as the gun that won the West. That's right? right. OK. That's right. 1873, the US Army says, man, we want a new standard service revolver for our officers, cavalrymen. So they held these trials. They get all the gun makers to come out, show off their stuff, brag about it, shoot it. Colt is the one that won out. The 1873 Colt Single Action Army originally came out, the seven and a half inch barrel, which is what we got right here. And this is the, what, five inch barrel? That's five and a half. And by single action, you mean that I have to cock this hammer back every time I want to fire around. That's right. Now, in my opinion, it's like driving a sports car. You want to stick shift and all that <laughs> stuff. Who wants the automatic? You want to feel the roads, you know? You want to so shift for... the gears. Loading this is a process. The cylinder doesn't pop out like some revolvers, things like that. You got to do it one at a time. So you bring the hammer back to half cock. You flip the loading gate open. Allows the cylinder to spin free. Start grabbing your rounds. We do what we call the cowboy load, which is basically loading five out of six. And you can look down, see the rim, and make sure that that chamber in front of this hammer is empty. Because basically, if something flips that hammer, or if you drop the gun, it's the same as you pulling that trigger and that hammer coming down, and it will go off. Doesn't seem like something you could do if you were really in a hurry, you know what I mean? Whenever you get into a stressful environment, fine motor skills kind of go away, so that could become something that's very complicated. It's not like dropping magazines, and, right? And shoving them in, which is why you guys don't use these anymore. Magazines are better. <laughs> In its day, the 1873 Colt Single Action Army was state-of-the-art. It played a significant role in the Spanish-American War when the U.S. fought for control over Cuba and other Spanish colonies. In the conflict's decisive battle, Teddy Roosevelt and his first U.S. Volunteer Cavalry, better known as the Rough Riders, charge up the Spanish stronghold of San Juan Hill. When the Rough Riders reach the top, it's the Peacemaker that makes the difference in the close quarters fighting. The battle makes Teddy Roosevelt a national figure, and the legend of the Colt Peacemaker grows. So I understand the original round was a 250-grain bullet, which is weight, propelled by 40 grains of powder, which is an actual amount. Right. OK. So that 40 grains would push that lead slug out I mean, it kicked, OK? Right. So after a while, the Army says, well, what if we load it down a little bit, make it a little easier to handle, a little more controllable, get on target? So they went down to 30 grains of black powder. OK. However, with me, I have an entire box with the original loads, if you are game. 40 grains of powder? That's it. What did you think I was going to let you shoot out here by yourself? Yeah, I'm game. All right, let's do it. To compare the ballistic power of the Colt, we're going to test it against one of its predecessors, the 1851 Navy cartridge conversion. I'll be shooting the 45 caliber Colt, while Joey will shoot the 38 caliber Navy into a block of ballistics gelatin. This will reveal the kinetic energy transferred into the body from the round. A chronograph will also measure each round's velocity. First up, the 38 Navy. Now it's my turn with the Colt 45 Peacemaker. 
All right, so what we have here is we've got the 38 over here, we've got the 45 here. With your 38, you had a smaller caliber round traveling at a slower muzzle velocity, it was a 913 approximately. Right. So as it enters, you're gonna see that good cavitation as it comes through. With this ballistic gel, you see a rebound, and then you get kind of that bounce, and it's an opening of that temporary cavity, and then a closing. You're left with this permanent cavity. Right. Now over here, with the 45 caliber round, you've got a larger caliber round traveling at a higher muzzle velocity, yeah. 1,200 feet per second. So you've got a greater transfer of kinetic energy into the gel, which is why we see the larger cavitation, and then as it tumbles, the concussion wave moves through, and you've got more rebound with the ballistic gel. So in a firefight, I'd rather have the Colt 45 than your 38. That's true. They say God created man, Colt made him equal. So far, we've seen the pistol evolve from an unreliable and complicated wheel lock design to a simpler but temperamental flintlock. And later, the first cap and ball revolver. Inspired by advances in firearms technology throughout the ages, the Colt Manufacturing Company was at the forefront of pistol design in the 19th century. Everybody wanted to carry a Colt 45. But how did the Peacemaker match up to the Army Standard Issue rifle of its day? Joey Dillon will help me find out. For our next test, it's a rate of fire examination between the Peacemaker and the U.S. Army's first breech-loaded rifle, the 1873 Trapdoor. We're gonna have targets from 10 all the way out to 100 yards. And you're gonna have one minute to pop off as many rounds as you can. You ready? Let's do it. All right. One, two, three. After an even start, Joey's six-chamber revolver quickly takes the lead over my single-shot rifle. Oh, shit, I got it. <laughs> he even hits the plate at 100 yards, where I was hoping my rifle would have the edge. I'm gonna call that a hit. I got off six, how'd you do? Oh, 12 rounds, you know. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> Seven out of eight plates, but 12 rounds fired. When I hit five out of six, so my shooting percentage is higher than yours, but obviously you got off more rounds, and I think I'm definitely more accurate at You're distance. way more accurate. Let me say this. I hit this the first shot, blam! But I couldn't repeat it in four more shots. <laughs> As Joey demonstrated, in the right hands, the Peacemaker is accurate, even at 100 yards. What's great about Colt revolvers like the Peacemaker is that they can be loaded and fired by anyone. That's why they became known as the Great Equalizer, because no matter your skill set, in theory, you could load it and be equal to anyone else who was packing one. Complicated muzzle loaders became pretty much a thing of the past. In the early 1890s, the Army turned to a sidearm with a smaller 38 caliber round. The 1894 Colt revolver is easier to aim and shoot than a 45. But its limitations become obvious in the Philippines when Americans fight nationalist tribesmen. The Colt 38 seriously lacks stopping power. So the Army commissions a new 45 caliber pistol. The winning design? the Colt M1911. This isn't just a change in ammo. It offers semi-automatic fire, a quantum leap in firearms technology. This pistol receives the 45 ACP cartridge. It's a heavier, wide diameter round, so you get a greater transfer of energy into your target. Let's go see how powerful this really is. We'll test it on a standard tissue model in military simulations a pig carcass. We're gonna do a comparison between the Colt 38 and the M1911. The 38, of course, is the weapon that gave so much trouble during the Philippine insurrection.
All right, that was the 38. Now time for the 1911. We're gonna take a look at our tissue model. You're gonna see three rounds in this guy. Here's two from the 38, one from the 45. This one with the 45 is slightly larger. Once we look inside, we can see that the 45, as it passed through, made a fairly large hole. That's that distribution of energy. With the 38, it's a little bit smaller. Over here on the other side, we can see some bone chips where that 38 went in. And then take a look at this 45. The tissue is just so expanded that it's almost ripping off the carcass. And on the high-speed camera, we see this skin absorb that trauma and all that energy. Even though I've got two rounds of 38 in here, it looks like the 45 did the most damage. So has more stopping power. Again, a better transfer of energy. It's the way to go. Colt 1911 is so valued by soldiers that it's used through both World Wars, Korea, Vietnam, and is still carried by some Special Forces units today. However, in 1985, U.S. Armed Forces retired the Colt 1911 in favor of a more modern Beretta 9mm. It was a dark day for many servicemen. The Beretta Model 92 SBF follows in a long line of high-performance European sidearms. Britain's legendary Webley revolvers were standard issue from 1887 through 1963. Early Webleys were known for the stopping power of their 455 round. All were known for the top brake design that quickly ejected spent shells. On the continent, the revolver would soon be obsolete pushed aside by the semi-automatic pistol. Germany's World War I era Luger was among the first of this new breed. Germany replaced the Luger with the Walther P-38 just prior to World War II. The P-38 fires the same round at roughly the same velocity as the Luger, but it's much more reliable and far cheaper to make. The Walther faced the Soviet Union's TT-33 on the Eastern Front. The Red Army carried nearly two million of these robust pistols to the front line. In 1951, the Soviets replaced their TT-33 with the Makarov PM. Compact and lethal, this semi-automatic was preferred by the Spetsnaz, covert Soviet forces. The Makarov was ingeniously designed with few moving parts. Just shy of one foot in length, the intimidating Desert Eagle is jointly produced by Israel and the U.S. Some models chamber the 50 caliber Action Express, one of the most powerful pistol rounds on the planet. Far from the limelight, the U.S. Navy SEALs get their job done with the Swiss-made Sig Sauer P226 Navy. Its precision action has prompted some to call it the Cadillac of tactical firearms. Beginning with the Model 17 in 1982, Glock pioneered the use of synthetic materials in handguns. Since then, this Austrian company has produced a series of reliable, highly regarded semi-automatic pistols. In Italy, Beretta's reliable Model 1934 semi-auto pistol was issued primarily to officers and a few select troops. It was the springboard for the 92 SBF that the U.S. military would adopt as the M9. Former Marine firearms instructor Grant Reynolds claims the M9 is especially effective when engaging moving targets. To test that theory, I've brought in a very challenging target. It matches your shirt. Are you ready for this? I don't think you are. I think I'm gonna be okay with your driving. <laughs> All right, we'll see what happens. Yeah, bring it on. All right. Hot! Wow, it's actually pretty fast. A small target moving at 30 miles per hour is a challenge for any shooter. But Beretta advocates believe its design provides greater agility and accuracy. I 
think you might have got it. I'm pretty sure I got it right when it came over that, that first jump. Whatever, man. Can you see anything? Uh, it's definitely in op right now. It's not working. Let's look for an impact anywhere. Oh, the round went through the tire right Shut there. Shut the front door. You're not kidding, dude. Look at that. The round went through the tire right there, exited over here. The bullet is in the motor. It left the metal jacketing actually inside of here. And maybe, there we go. If I give it a little shake, you can see some of the pieces. But here's some of that metal from the round. So it's still got electricity, yeah. but it's not going anywhere. It's like, it's like when a human being gets shot in the pelvis. I mean, the heart's still pumping, sure. but the wheels ain't moving. You there know you what go. I mean? And that's what we got here. Very cool. I didn't think you got it. I didn't think I was going to get it. I'll be honest with you. I was going, I don't know about that. That was awesome. Round's on target. Grant is obviously an expert marksman, but I asked what advantages the Beretta holds over the Colt. Number one, magazine capacity. We're working with 15 rounds as opposed to the seven that you have in that uh, right. M1911. So I can put way more lead down range while you're busy doing magazine changes. Secondly, you know, we're still using that short recoil operation, but now with the nine mil, it's just a little bit lighter. So that allows me to put that front side tip right back on target every time I shoot around. It just goes right back. I gotta be honest with you, I really like the Beretta, but I've been working with this 1911 and I'm really liking it. I like its stopping power. I like the caliber round that it has. The action smooth. I think that I'd rather carry that 1911. How do you feel? I'll choose this Beretta all day long. Sounds like a challenge. Absolutely. Okay, then we should probably get a little bit more practice before we head out and do this. I'm ready. All right, let's go. Let's do it. It took centuries of firearms innovations for us to arrive at the powerful and reliable Colt M1911 the most popular American military sidearm of all time. To get a better appreciation of this modern masterpiece, I learned how to load and fire the earliest pistol, the wheel lock. It was big and cumbersome, but at close range, it rocked. The simpler and cheaper flint lock replaced the wheel lock. I found its ignition system was actually slower to fire. The next major leap in firearms development was rapid fire. It was Samuel Colt who created the first practical revolver, the 1836 Patterson. In 1873, the Colt Company introduced its first 45 caliber revolver, the single action army, commonly known as the Peacemaker. By World War I, the revolver gave way to the semi-automatic pistol, and a new Colt 45, the M1911, began its long rivalry against the 9mm round when it faced the German Luger. Now it's time for our final test of the Colt 45 and of my skills with it. I'm challenging former Marine Corps firearms instructor Grant Reynolds to a multi-stage course featuring guns that we've examined during this show. This course was designed by our production team and is overseen by firearms expert and movie gun handler, Mike Tristano. Will and Grant must now race to different stations featuring the most groundbreaking pistols in the history of sidearms. They need to hit all of the targets before advancing to the next station. First, they must fire the flintlock, then the Colt Patterson revolver, and then the Peacemaker. Finally, Grant will use his modern pistol of choice, the Beretta M9, while Will carries the Colt Model 1911. They'll face drop targets that fall when hit by a strong force of impact. And the first one past that round will take out the final target. Ready? Set? Flint lock, flint lock, flint lock. Breathe, just breathe. Cocked it, pointed, shot it. If I had had a misfire, whole different story. I get to the next station, which is the Colt Patterson. It might as well be just like the flintlock because the sights on there are not my favorite. The problem with the Colt Patterson is the trigger squeeze. It takes almost probably 20 pounds of force in order to draw that trigger back to the rear, where with a single action pistol, you're two, three pounds. Come on!
That peacemaker sets up really nice for my sights. It's a little bit windy out here, so I brought up my other hand and just did a little isometrics there and just started shooting all day. I had a lot of trouble with the Colt single action. The problem is really making my point of aim and point of impact the same. My point of aim is here on the target while my point of impact was over here. With non-adjustable sights, you have to adjust your point of aim or something you're doing with your technique to bring those two things together in a line and make them work out. Oh, you're such a pain in the butt to unload. How did you do it, Sam? I could see that Grant was ahead of me, and I was still trying to reload. Come on, baby. I had to put a lot of lead down range to get that thing to drop. That Beretta just does not have the stopping power that that 45 ACP round has. Basically, these targets weren't going down, so I knew I had a chance. I came up, pulled my 45, two rounds, one in each target. Those rounds dropped right away. Last target was mine. Mine! That's it, baby, that's it. I you like that. Nice job, man. What I learned today is that every weapon system is different, and you have to really practice with those things to be proficient. Now, as far as the differences between 9mm and 45, with that 9mm, you bring more rounds to the fight, but I think with the 45, you're bringing a way bigger punch, and that's the way to go. This is not a definitive test between the Colt 1911 and the Beretta 9mm, but it does demonstrate that even after 100 years, the Colt 45 is still a force to be reckoned with. These guns are a critical step in the history of firearms. They represent innovation, determination, and independence. And it's a testament to the genius of Samuel Colt and John Browning that the Colt 45 is still respected and beloved by servicemen and collectors alike. I'm Will Willis, locked and cleared. I'll see you next time on The Range.